Hey, while they're getting set up, I'm going to mention one other, I think a great thing that ties in with what John was just talking about on a localism or kind of circumnavigating the systems um, that we've been doing as a church, which is in our, we do have a, a general missions fund that we're involved with, but we have specifically um, been able to bless a certain church over in Liberia um, that we've been able to funnel monies to directly, and we're able to see the the manifestation of what God is doing with those funds immediately because we've set up a, a Facebook page where they're able to post daily, which they do it more than daily most of the time, but what's going on. And so recently we were able, they made us aware of a need for a number of children that had been brought to their attention from Muslim villages nearby the parents begging them, asking them, could you teach our children because you have a school? They said, we'd love to, but we are a Christian school. Um, as long as you're willing to have your children taught Christian things, we'd love it. But then they brought it to our attention and said, uh, if we're going to do this, we need this many chalkboards, this many chairs, this many more teachers. They budgeted out for us and said, we need about probably $9,000 to make this happen. Yeah. $70 yeah. per teacher per year. Uh, you know, they, they budgeted it out for us. And in God's good goodness, uh, he allowed us to send money over there. And we're already seeing the daily reports of, here's uh, the, the paint job we did on the on the school building. Here are the, school, the new school uniforms. Here's the new school your uniforms being, being um, yeah, hand sewn. And here's the delivery of the new chairs. And here's the chalkboard. And, and then a, of filming as they walk through and show all the classes in session. And the delight on the children's faces. Um, I mean, if we were to have gone through conventional channels, um, we would have sent money somewhere, and when would we have learned what that accomplished? Probably never. And it would have cost about four times as much Absolutely. because of bureaucracy. Bureaucracy and a, an Ameri North American mindset. We would have never That's imagined right. accomplishing yeah. that much for $9,000, yeah. you know, just yeah. because yeah. our standards of, you know, what, what that looks like to do are completely different. Um, Let's see. I never received any specific questions, so this is going to be a bit of a free-for-all. I'm going to mention one other <coughs> resource that I have found a great blessing. Just It's called The Story of Freedom. Kevin Swanson wrote this. Um, this is a really... Have any of you guys read this or, or been, are aware of this? Swanson, I haven't read that. This is an excellent um, kind of summary. I, I think he's a great... He's a, he's a pastor, but he's also a very, I think, very good historian. And he documents how f the freedoms that we've enjoyed were obtained. Um, he really documents over 800 years of Christian heritage that we have been blessed by. And then how the, let's just call it the left, has worked very meticulously to destroy those freedoms. Mm -hmm. But then he concludes in the last section on how we can regain the freedoms, which tie in very nicely with the things we've been considering today. Um, I also had mentioned at the beginning about Pierre Verret. Um, this, this was compiled. This is a number of his writings that were compiled. He was a Swiss reform pastor from 1511 to 1571. And he dealt with tyranny in his day and very, very wonderfully, I think, works through um, how we can deal with uh, living in this environment. I love chapter 10, how the sheep will vanquish the wolves, um, just as a, a great title. So yeah. anyway, I, have, I do have some questions I could work with, but if you guys have some specific things you want to flesh out, over the next few minutes, too. Okay. Over the next 15 minutes? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to go too long. We got, you can uh, take, as long as you promise not to grandstand, we'll take your questions, <laughs> all y'all. Right there. Um, John, what do you do about orthodoxy in the church? In a para church movement or uh, effort, so to speak, you can get a lot of different people kind of coalesced together under a conservative banner, somewhat like a Christian banner, 
and yet at the end of the day there is not a lick of orthodoxy in between them so therefore the church never really gets built How, what do you do we're struggling it looks to me like for churches with sound orthodoxy to launch things into the community not things from the community that make the kind of an ecumenical kingdom so to speak so are you talking about like pro-life co-belligerency where Catholics and Protestants come together to on the capital steps or you know they're all good things but then at the bottom yeah, at the end of the day there's no orthodox church for these people to go to Oh, okay, so so if that happens and they're there to support pro-life cause or you know abolition cause or whatever, there um, there's not like a church banner in the front that they can send people to. You mean is that the problem? You're all, all different kind of reasons people are there. All kind of different reasons people come to the school board, or all kind of different reasons people homeschool. But where does the orthodoxy from the church direct and build? And I, I'm seeing this all falling apart. Yeah, I, I think I know, I, I'm, I'm having a little trouble understanding where the question is coming from. I, I'm, my guess is what you're trying to say is that uh, if it's not, if any of the things I just talked about, like, okay, so like, for instance, Moms for Liberty, who knows who some of these people are, but they're pushing against CRT in the schools. Right. Like, if that doesn't, if it's locus is not the church, if the church isn't the one directing this, then is it okay for Christians to be involved? Is that, am I getting you right? Not so much that, it becomes a substitution for the church, and it becomes a substitution for sound orthodoxy, which is this kind of sacrifice along the way. Okay, wait, well, yeah. yeah. His question seems to be, let me see if I can summarize your, a question. Your, your question is, how do we do that work while building the church? Because... Uh, I would argue that we can't reclaim America without rebuilding the church. Right. And so your, his question for you is the, the things that you've talked about, how do we apply them in building the church? Is that a good summary? Yeah. And sound orthodoxy, sound doctrine from the church, how is it going to come out of that grassroots movement? Okay. So I, I think I, so that it's not going to, obviously Moms for Liberty isn't going to produce the gospel because that's not why they exist. They simply exist to keep children from listening to perverts read them stories and naked pictures in junior high and elementary school. Yeah, so uh, that's a Christian, I mean, it does tales with a Christian ethical um, uh, c considerations, but it's not overtly gospel ministry it's not ministry, really. It's not. It's not a church. It's that's more of a political thing. So I, I kind of see it as um, because there's different spheres and different responsibilities that each sphere has to, to God. Like I, I, I believe I could I could go with someone who's like separation of church and state. I'll say, well, yeah, to a point. I understand what you're saying. If, if you're saying that ecclesiastical and magisterial power should not be mingled, I, I say sure. I get that. But there's no separation of government and God. So. That, that's where I would look at the government, let's say, in this case, unfortunately, this is wrong. We shouldn't have government, or national government funded schools. That's another story. But, but this is, we're talking about the governmental branch here. And um, their job is not to preach the gospel. Now, I think it's to protect it. I think it's to um, make sure that churches can operate. It's to apply Christian principles and ethics. But they're not going to catechize, you, you know, your... Uh, I was going to have to say your children and sound like a Presbyterian a little bit. I almost veered that way. But the, yeah. Uh, but they're, they don't baptize people. They don't, um, they, they don't, yeah. So they have an interest in marriage, but they're not the ones performing the ceremonies, right? So th I, that's why I made a separation in my talk, and I tried to say political conservatives and then uh, theological conservatives. And I definitely see a commonality there in that both are trying to get a version of Christian ethics, um, might be broad now, but they're, they're trying to do something in that realm, uh, in, in that way. But there's a definite separation there, and we can't lose that separation. If we ever do, then we're toast, because we, we do give up the gospel if we just think, well, he's a Catholic, and we can be pro-life together. Isn't that wonderful? We're the same thing. So I don't know if that answers your question. Maybe, so Joseph seemed to understand better. Do you want to Um, 
the church has a mission to proclaim the gospel, right? And, and, and to raise up disciples. And as we make disciples, as the church, as an organization makes disciples, those disciples will go out and be involved in different ministries, be involved in, um, in politics. And so it's, as we think about Jesus and politics, the, it's not necessarily the church as an organization, organization's responsibility to control politics, but the people in the church go forth and they do that work. And so I think a Christian can go forth and find co-belligerence and, and do the work with, what, what was the mom group? Moms for, Moms for Liberty. As they're doing that work, they need to be evangelizing the people they're doing that work with. The gospel needs to go forth. It never, it never needs to be hid. Uh, I was reading G.K. Chesterton last night, and he said, the old hypocrites, the old hypocrites, uh, um, said they were religious and then went about doing other things under the cover of religion. And he says, the new hypocrites deny being religious and go and say they're only doing politics or they're only doing practical things. And that's really what conservatives are doing. Like they go and they'll go and, and protest drag queen story hour, but then say, you know, we're, 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 we don't have a really big problem with gay stuff. We're just... We're just the kids, and we're not trying to be Christians about this. It's just a secular thing. And so they're, they're, they're covering that up. I don't think we should ever do any of that. And, uh, and then the third thing, uh, one more thing I would say about that, as you do that work with organizations, your heart and your passion needs to be about building the church and committed to the church, because that is the one institution that Christ established, and that is the, the one that will go forth. That's, that's the one that's promised not to be defeated. So, yep. Amen. Um, it seems to me, okay, this, this book, the story of freedom, reminded me of a couple things that came up in, I think, both Tim and, and Joe's talks. Um, Tim, you, you um, spoke about the, the, the longing for freedom that... that Believers have, but the the but then Joe also talked about um, without abortion, women will be enslaved. That's the fear. So it sounds like um, so that so the, the the left is saying we want freedom because if we have to have children, that's bondage, right? We want freedom, so we don't want to have children. Yeah, yeah. The Christian is saying no, we want freedom, and so therefore we want to live freely under God. What both of us are cr crying out it seems like for the same thing maybe defined differently. How does that look in in reality? Why are we both longing for freedom but seeing the what freedom is as two different things? Well, let me just say the, the what I said in my talk was that uh, w within a a specifically Christian following the general equity of the law principle type of government, which, again, we were talking last night, excited about, you know, Alfred the Great, and then the Magna Carta, and then English common law, and all of that, how that all goes back to the old, the old covenant, how that necessarily produces the greatest amount of liberty right. among any people, like, regardless of ethnicity, background, nationality, uh, kin, all of that, it always produces, wh why is that? Because God is the author of it. And the irony is that that freedom that the pagans want, freedom from the strictures of God's law, always produces greater tyranny. It's, it's, you can measure it through history. It always produces a, a, a lessening of individual, not just rights, but the ability to think and have a conscience that's free in the right sense. Now listen, there, there's, again... I heard one of the one of the uh, criticisms of Christian nationalism is that we we're refusing to say whether we're going to uh, require the baptizing of babies in our magic state. Now, I was, that's not the question. That's that's none of this, right? What we're talking about is freedom to exercise your responsibilities in a community that that we're always tied together uh, as far as being necessary 
sides of the same coin. Without that requisite responsibility, then your freedom, I had a, a junior high history teacher, he's one of my favorites, he, he, he taught my dad in high school, so now we're back to the 15th century. Um, but but he, he asked for a definition of freedom, and the kid that everybody picked on because he had it coming said, freedom is the ability to do what you want. And mm -hmm. the guy took his stick and whacked it on his desk. Wrong! It says, freedom is the ability for me to swing my fist at the end of your nose and not touch it. And we understood what he meant. It's, it's within limits. There are always limits to freedom. Uh, one of the freedoms that I think is being expressed now is the freedom to uh, defy creation and creation norms. Without those norms, eh, we're, mm -hmm. we are toast. And then, they, again, the tyranny follows. Yeah, uh, Satan only always counterfeits. He's a liar. Does, he's not a creator. He's a destroyer. And his lie to Eve was, you're basically enslaved to God, and you, you need to be like God. And so the, the, the lawless call for freedom is, is it's a lie. Yeah. And uh, as Tim was saying, sin enslaves so they think they are getting freedom when they're putting on shackles i've always i've always said when we were street preaching and stuff that we think that we can throw off god's 10 laws and be free but we throw off god's 10 laws and they're replaced with thousands upon thousands of little human laws i did a research once to try to find out how many federal laws and regulations there are. And what I found out is that the federal government does not know. <laughs> they officially do not know. Yeah. So, Well, um, quote from William Penn, those who will not be governed by God will be ruled by tyrants. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I see some hands. Yeah, I want to hear your question because we had a conversation earlier that... So if the world's standard of right and wrong and freedom is obviously not God's standard, how does a Christian in politics avoid neutrality because we're playing by different standards so how yeah how do i legislate morality how do i, how do I legislate god's law like isn't that always going i feel like is that even possible <laughs> like it's obviously that's the rule and i want to do that but is it i don't want to be fighting a lost cause you know like is it possible yeah so that, that's the the that goes back to actually that quote from chesterton right so he was talking basically about people that, that you have a religious thing, which, or we, we want to say we have God's law as our standard, and then lying about it, covering it up, act like we don't, pretending like there's some kind of neutral ground. And there's not. And so one of the reasons that conservatives have failed and Christians have failed for so long is they've tried to play this neutral ground. And they try to play as if they do, their intentions are not their intentions. And there may be times when you want to do that. Like when, in war, you don't always articulate your every move. But on the other hand, a constant like shine away from your actual goals and stuff is, I think it's, it's it counterproductive. It leaves you, there is no uh, neutral ground. What it leaves you doing is giving ground to the other side and then playing around on their, their side while you've given up your own. So I would argue we need Christians who are boldly Christians, even in our land. And that is going to sound un-American. People are going to think you're un-American because of that. And you just got to say, you know what? God comes first. And America comes second, and God's law trumps even if, even if, if, so I, I don't think that when they say that separation of church and state, that they're actually accurately interpreting the Constitution, because that's not how the country was founded. But even if they were accurate, then it would be wrong. The Bible and God's word trumps the United States Constitution. So, even, but their interpretation of it is wrong. But, I just think we just think Christians have to be Christians, and they have to be Christians in public. I, I, I like how you, how you framed that, legislate God's law. I just want to give an example from like the 90s. Uh, you've heard of Chuck Colson, prison fellowship, one of the guys who went to jail for the Watergate scandal. Later on, he became very active in prison reform, 
basing it on exactly those general equity principles of the Bible. Now, he wouldn't telegraph everything, like Joseph just said, but he would suggest these reforms that instead of uh, longer sentencing and all of that, he said, hey, why don't we require these criminals to work to pay back the victims that they had stolen from? And everyone's like, wow, well, that's a, that's a good idea, restitution. That's cool. Where'd that come from? Well, if you open your Bibles. And he was able to do that in a way. Now, I don't know how many of these reforms were actually, it became law or whatever. But that's one of the ways he would do it. And I think that's, uh, that's not unconventional warfare to go ahead and just say it. Well, open your Bible, Leviticus 18. There it is. Leviticus 19, love your neighbor. Wow, that's in the old time. What? You know, so some people are, as our culture goes on, we become more and more biblically ignorant. You know, I, I love it in, a, in an old, older British TV show where they'll just quote something out of the Bible and everyone knows what they're talking about. Yeah, it was 20 years ago. <laughs> so that's, that's one way that you can still uh, think in terms of accomplishing that goal while not, again, doing that head for head absolute. Here's what it says there. So that's how we're going to apply the divorce laws. Well, for the people. So anyway. Okay, one more. How about Bill back there? Uh, so, Joe, you, you talked a bit about um, the kind of subversive stuff going on with the, the abortion um, drugs and all that stuff and, and the kind of an expose of that. And John, you, you do quite a bit of expose as well in terms of uh, church leadership um, and, and saying... You know, these guys may be not the stalwarts you, you thought they were. How important do you think uh, expose in that regard is uh, to the church? And how do you do that in a balanced way so you don't become, you know, some screaming tinfoil hat wearing person? And, 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 you know, so first, how important is the expose to maintaining? A level of sanity while doing it. And, and, and I would add tag onto that and also emphasizing the unity of the body and building together, right? Not, okay. No, no, I would No, no, you don't want to add that? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> you know, Paul tells Titus that he's to pick elders and, and, and part of their job is to instruct and to teach and also to uh, reprove those who have strayed. And then he spends some time, he does expose them there, right? There's these empty talkers. You know, even one of their own says they're always liars. And, and, and so that is the work, I would say, of a pastor is, is instructing and then warning, right? This is good food. This is bad food. Uh, that's balanced, if you're only pointing to the bad food, you just strike people with fear and they may not ne never eat. Like, if, if, you, if we, we don't just tear down, we have to build. It's got to be both. And um, so I, I really appreciated John's talk about how we have to build. And, and, and so that's very important because we, the, as a pastor, I believe the church is, uh, I've already said, the, the, the institution that Christ established. And so even as we point out heresies, we point out false teachers, we've got to be careful that we don't want to diminish people's trust in the institution that Christ established. Yeah. And, and so we are reformers, not revolutionaries. We're, we're not rebels. So. Hmm. I, mean, I like what you said. Uh, well, okay. No, did you, uh, do you Yeah, I want to go to another question. You, you satisfied? Sure, yeah. <laughs> you like that, Bill? I thought I that was great. You, you're known for a, a lot of that. I am? Well, like, like hey, you and AD are able to yeah. uh, point out where these institutional leaders have gone astray. Mm -hmm. So you, you do that a lot, which is, which is well, absolutely... It's, it's born fruit, in my opinion, as far as people having questions. Because a lot of the time, I think the Holy Spirit... we gives us impressions now now I know we're going to start speaking in tongues and 
All right. Well, anyway, uh, I think that there's a, dis- even, even if it's just a discernment you have, your conscience is tuned to the word of God and you hear something, you're like, I just don't know. There's some- something doesn't sit well with me with this. I just can't put my finger on it. I- I've helped people that have that know exactly what it is that didn't sit right with them. And then they're able to articulate it to their pastor or to um, others who have to share similar concerns and they're able to organize. And so I've seen that over and over. And, and that's why I've, one of the big reasons I've done what I've done. So I think it bears fruit, but I agree with what Joseph said completely, 100%. In fact, um, I, I always say this. I say this a lot on the podcast that I'm a supplement. I'm not a multivitamin. Don't listen to just my podcast. If you are, like, shame on you because um, it's gonna, it, it can leave you unbalanced if you're just listening to... And I, I have branched out and not just talked about this, but I do talk a lot about compromised church leaders. And it, you, you have to be able to... Um, also, like Joseph was saying, build and trust the institution God set up. And a lot of these people that I've critiqued, though, are parachurch, if you've noticed. They're not actually... <laughs> How many of them aren't even pastors? Yeah. Al Mohler's not a pastor. Okay, Tim Keller is a retired emeritus pastor. But even if you go to his church and you see the network he has, it's... I mean, I guess maybe my polity is going to come out, but if you have a church of a certain size where no one knows you and they can't figure out if you even meet the qualifications of a pastor and you don't do church discipline and you, the ordinances are... Just, I'm like, is this a church? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of these people, I just don't even know if, they're, if they even fit into that, um, that paradigm of being in the ecclesiastical realm. They're, they're supposed to be supporting local church ministry, but oftentimes they are... Uh, they're doing the exact opposite. So I just tell you, hey, this isn't helping your church. So right. anyway. Okay, Tim was advocating for one more. I think I saw him. Yeah, well, go ahead. I had a question when you were talking about getting real. And because um, I was just thinking about the election of 2020 and how it was based. I believe it was stolen. And so can we trust the electoral process that's going on right now with the interference of big tech and you know, ballot stuffing in the post office, and you watch all these things, and you're like, you go to bed, and he's ahead, and then there's a water main break, and then all of a sudden, you're like, like, and and so it's really discouraging, I think, because if the actual process is corrupted, where do you go from here? And then I wanted to get your thoughts on possible, like, states um, seceding, and forming the republic, and would that be considered revolutionary? (laughs) <laughs> oh, <stop. laughs> um, man. <laughs> yeah, start whistling Dixie. Um, well, so the, the first question was about the election process. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. I remember that, that period between the inauguration and the election. And even mainstream conservatives, many of them, uh, not all, but many were giving Trump some credence on this and, well, we need to see and we're going to have a... uh, Something might happen to make sure Trump actually does get back in the White House. And it's funny to hear them all now trusting the same system, saying like, well, if you just go vote... And I'm like, yeah, like, I don't know. That just... It makes me wonder a little. But so here's here's what I'll say. um, Because I have talked to people in some of these swing states where there were funny things going on and there has been some work done I know on the local level some people did try to mobilize that is the answer it, you know if you're in a state that has this issue which I think every state actually probably does to an extent it's not just the swing states then getting involved on the local level at the election board level is good I, I lived in Lynchburg Virginia okay this is where Liberty University is when this all happened you'd think like evangelical right they were counting uh, absentee ballots before the election, that's illegal. The Republican Party sued. During the election, our local, where, where you vote, the local uh, polling station uh, place, uh, their mach- Dominion machine, I don't know if they were Dominion, uh, they were, but their digital machine shut down in the middle of, of it. They wouldn't let the Republican inspectors look at it. This is in the Bible Belt, right? So if it's, if it's there, then, then who knows? So I, I do have a, a cynicism about it, but that's why I tend to um, push people towards trying to think 
and, and this is where there's tension with Christian nationalism because it's nationalism and many people think nation is this big. I, I think there's a human <laughs> scale problem in our country. This, and this is doving right into your second question. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but you know, James Madison had an idea about how many uh, people should, how many um, representatives per like population, that ratio. And I can't remember the numbers, I don't have them right in front of me, but it was, it's like so off now, it's ridiculously off, where you, we don't have any accountability. We don't know who our representatives are on the national level. And so America's too big. That's a huge, huge problem that's playing into our, like when I, I flew last year from, uh, I was in, in Alabama and I was doing, making a documentary and um, I remember going in one day from Alabama to uh, Seattle. <laughs> and I'm like, man, these two places are in the same country. country. <laughs> Yeah. How? These are completely, they might speak the same language, almost, but it, I, I remember that. When you, when you yeah, said, actually it was Portland. It was Portland. Not really a nation. We're an empire. Bingo. That's a perfect, yeah, we're the Roman Empire with, with, yeah, we're not a nation. We have multiple nations in, in this, multiple cultures. And so you've got to think of, you've got to answer the question, who are your people? And that's a hard question to answer, but I think you can figure it out. I, I've answered it for my, so obviously my family's my first priority, but beyond that, it's my locality, it's my church, it's the people around me, my neighbors. Um, and, and then beyond that, it's people who share my, my culture. And so um, I'm kind of in a weird spot where my dad has always told me from when I was a kid and we moved to New York, I'm a missionary here. These aren't, in, in a certain sense, these aren't really your people, but we're, we're here to be a missionary. And so... I feel a kinship in some ways with people that live in other states that I share more in common with. I, I share more in common with you all probably than a lot of the people that live near me. So, so it's a complicated answer for me, but it is for every American now. It's kind of a complicated answer. But once you actually answer it, I think you know how to invest your resources better. And it, it, it can answer all kinds of questions like where should I live? Um, you know, where, where should my kids grow up? What, what kinds of activities, you know, voluntary associations should I be involved with? Uh, and, and so my goal isn't to take back America at that point, because I've already, well, that ship sailed in my mind. It's to influence my local community and the, the people around me. And, um, and that's a much more attainable goal. And, and so, if, uh, yeah, so if we can have a, a little piece of America saved <laughs> in, a, in a state that wants to secede, I think that would be great. Or if the left wants to get rid of California, I was born there, my family there, but... They can take one for the team, you know, let's, uh, <laughs> I mean, I was just there. I'm like, this isn't America anymore. This is ridiculous. Uh, and what part of California? Well, it was SoCal, down in uh, Los Angeles. I'm telling you, so. San, Diego, San Diego County. San Diego's better, but. Like different. Yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, there's, Again, but then we're talking about the same exact thing, aren't we? Yeah, and if states want to break up. There. California, so California, look at electoral map, overwhelmingly red. So is New York, by the yeah. way. Overwhelmingly. It's these little blue pockets that control the rest of the state. So, it's so so like in California, their whole thing is Jefferson. The nor the conservative areas are going to become what's called Jefferson. In fact, when you're driving there, I did this a few years ago. You'll pass signs saying "Welcome to Jefferson." Um, in Oregon, they want to join Idaho. I mean, this stuff makes a lot of sense. But the Christian, the not the Christian nationalists, but the people. I'm going on too long here, but there, there is an aversion to it, and we can talk about it afterward, but uh, sorry. Yeah. Daniel All right. Two, now a pervert. Fourth point. What's that? Daniel 2 and your fourth point. Your fourth point. Yeah. The rest of the Lord. Daniel 2. Every leader yep. is by God's appointment. Oh, that's so true. No matter how we vote, that person that ends up there is God's appointment. So I told people at our church, if, oh, if Biden, I call him Biden. <laughs> if Biden wins, he serves two months, and uh, Harris ends up as a president. That was God's choice. So we vote based on our own conscience, whatever, our research, and then we go to sleep at night and we trust and just rest. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, I. I think most of the state of Illinois would like to just jettison Chicago, and then they'd be fine. I, can I ask my Chicago visitors? Oh, yeah, that's, that's how it is, right? Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. If we could just push Chicago more towards Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> it might balance it out. It might be two red states then. 
<laughs> no, no, no. Um, we, we want them to go into Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, you haven't even thought about pushing them into the Great Lakes. That was... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, or Gitchy Gumi, as they say. There we well, go. Tim, you've got the mic. Do you want to close our... Time yeah, here? listen. Uh, every, everyone, thank you so much for uh, being here. I want to thank John Harris, Gold River Tea, <laughs> Joe Spurgeon. Are you still using that uh, that bump music for your podcast? Do you even do that anymore? Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. I can't use it then. And Pastor Kevin Minette, thank you for uh, emceeing. Let me close this in prayer. Listen, what, what the brother just said is right. Uh, we, we do what we can. Let's, let's concentrate on our own, first of all, our own families. Men, God has given you a great duty and responsibility, and it is such a joy when you're blessed by the Lord in that work. There's nothing like it. Wives, respect, submit to your husbands. They're doing their best. We're, we're just pathetic sometimes. And, and your support is undeniably part of a successful household. Amen, right? Amen. Then your local church. Reform from within, and and I'll tell you from experience, if that if you simply can't reform from within, there is such a thing as planning a church. You can do this, and whatever area of influence you have, that is an outpost for the kingdom of God, where you can influence, even control, saying not in my backyard. That's that's totally legit. And then, kind of at the outset, we vote and we leave the result to God. We say. You know, if I can, if I can influence a local town, uh, town council, school board, whatever, however that looks, or as Kurt nicely did, uh, ran for state representative and did some good work. So it can be done. Uh, the Turks are at the gate. Let's not argue about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. All right, the little minutia, right? There's a, there's some big stuff to get. We we need to get to work. Um, as you were as you were talking, uh, I said, well, dat post mill, brother. <laughs> that post no. All right, let's let's close in prayer. Our Father God, we are so grateful to you for allowing us to, first of all, meet together as your body, as people from uh, disparate ge- uh, geographical areas and even some theological areas, but uh, all of us being uh, united to Jesus by grace alone, through faith alone. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins without which we would still be lost still be in the flesh, and still be under your just condemnation. We thank you for the gospel of Christ, its saving power. We thank you for your spirit, which applies all these things to us, grants repentance and faith, and gives us a new heart in place of our old stony one. Now, Lord, I pray that you will help us as your people to be wise as we apply these truths, that we won't run off half-cocked into uh, error, uh, as your word says, that we wouldn't be hasty and miss the way. Help us to apply wisdom to this. We ask you for wisdom and help us to be uh, gospel-centered in all the right ways. Now, Lord, bless us as we leave this place. Give safe travel and help us to uh, export these good truths into all the areas from which we come. We give you all the glory for this and we ask it all for the glory and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hail to Jesus Christ.